My name is John Glendon. I'm a Rotary Youth Exchange student from Canada. Um, from Canada, I went to Auckland, New Zealand. And I'm in Fiji right now working on a project bringing tablets to kids. My role in this project is to be the group photographer, the guy who lifts the equipment, and I've taken somewhat of a teacher role. I just feel a good connection with the kids because they're so similar to my age. And I like having something that I know and pretty confident in and then letting them know. The idea of going across the world to live with a family who you've never met, to go to a school where you don't know a single person, to go to a country where you possibly don't know the language is absolutely terrifying. I was so afraid, so scared of absolutely everything. I was scared about like the little things, like what if they don't have my favorite brand of toothpaste? But if I could give one word of advice, one sentence of advice to anybody and every kid in the world is just do it. You won't regret it. In six months, I've become a different person. Emotionally, physically, mentally, I see things differently and I act differently and I'm confident in the way of speaking to people. I, I can't wait just to, to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm so happy with where I am in my life. I'm so happy that I've been able to teach and to tell people about my experiences, to hear their stories. Rotary Youth Exchange is where my new life and my new beginnings have started and I can't thank Rotary enough. Marks of our weekly luncheons. On any given Wednesday at noon, just know that we'll be here with a special experience crafted just for you. And all you have to do is show up and engage. Let's begin our program with the Song and Pledge from DJ Morrow Ingram, the Invocation from Justin Jones, and visitor introductions from President-elect Becky Fields. Good afternoon. Well, we don't have a pianist today, so we're not going to sing, but because school's starting, here's your test. We're going to recite the four-way test, and we don't have a cheat sheet up there. <laughs> so the four, but I do have a cheat sheet right in front of me. Uh, so the four-way test of the things we say, think, or do. One, is it the truth? Two, is it fair to all concerned? Three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Very good. I'm impressed. Yeah, you all didn't need your cheat sheet at all. So please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In light of our uh, guest today, I thought it'd be appropriate to share with you the prayer for church musicians. O oh, Heavenly Father, be ever present with your servants who seek through art and music to perfect the praises offered by your people on earth and to grant to them even now glimpses of your beauty and make them worthy, <clears throat> and make them worthy at length to behold it un unveiled forevermore. Amen. Good afternoon, I am Becky Fields and I am here to introduce the visitors today. And as you can see, I got held up a little bit out there because we have so many wonderful guests with us today. And I hate to do this, but it would take us a while. We have 18 guests. So instead of introducing everyone individually like we normally would, would all of our visiting guests and their host Rotarians please stand so we can give you a warm round of applause. And I would also like to introduce our Rotarians that are visiting from other clubs, if you would greet them by saying hi and their name. From the Bristow Club, we have Mickey Moore. Hi, Mickey. From the Sand Springs Club, we have John Fothergill. And transferring from Mission Vejeo, we have Barbara Kogerman. And her husband, Colonel Bill Kogerman. Welcome guests, and please join us anytime. Thank you. Thank you, DJ, Justin, and Becky. Once again, welcome to the Rotary Club of Tulsa, where Tulsa's finest business and community leaders come together to serve and to be the inspiration both in our community and all around the world. 
Let's thank our meeting volunteers whose service makes our meetings run so smoothly each week. Thanks also to this week's meeting sponsors, TTCU, Tim Lyons, Southern Hills Veterinary Hospital, Rodney Robards, Key Personnel, Stan McCabe, One Gas, Robert Babcock. We encourage you to give your fellow Rotarians the business, literally. This week's Rotary inspiration is past board chair Kathy Gorell. An anonymous Rotarian writes, Kathy Gorell is a role model that I wish every young woman in the country could experience. She is loving and kind, but also tough, and has a true gift for challenging those around her to become better than they are. Kathy is a courageous and unapologetic woman of great faith. She loves her family unconditionally. Kathy's dad and best friend, Ed Bentley, was a longtime Rotarian before his passing. With Ed Bentley as your best friend, I don't know how you couldn't end up kind, strong, empathetic, feisty, and brilliant, which is the heart of Kathy Gorell. Kathy, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Tulsa, please accept your Rotary International themed Be the Inspiration lapel pin for being our Rotary Inspiration. Congratulations, thank you. New member orientation, known as Yearling University, will be held Tuesday, August the 21st from 5.30 to 7 at the Centergy Building, 810 South Cincinnati. Please RSVP to the Rotary office if you plan on attending. Adopt a class, still needs our help to provide teachers with gift cards to purchase supplies. If you'd like to make a donation, please contact Tommy Lynn in the Rotary office. Be my guest, invitation cards are on your table. They look like this. These cards will help facilitate community outreach. Please use them to extend invitations to prospective Rotary Club of Tulsa members, and there's a place on the card for you to add your contact information. At this time, I'd like to introduce Rotarian Melissa Clark, who has a memorial res resolution for Bob Lucy. Melissa. First of all, I'd like to uh, recognize the people of uh, Bob Lucy's family and friends who are here today. Um, first of all, um, his grandson, Robert Lucy, and, um, Taylor, and uh, Taylor Burke's granddaughter, Pat Lucy, his wife, Kelsey Nay and her husband, Drew, and of course, Rotarians, Dane and Michael Burks. Be it resolved that members of the Rotary Club of Tulsa learned with great sorrow of the death of Robert Frank Lucy, February 13th, 2018. Bob Lucy served in the Rot Rotary Club of Tulsa for 15 years, was a Paul Harris Fellow, a Rotary Club of Tulsa Foundation Fellow, and a special lifetime member. Bob was born on September 7th, 1930 in Pawnee, Oklahoma, to Lillabelle Pazarek and Otto Castro Lucy. He attended Clawson High School in Oklahoma City and graduated in 1948. Upon graduation, he enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps for a two-year term as a private first-class basic infantryman. He served two years and was honorably discharged in March 1950 because he wanted to go to college. He enrolled in the University of Oklahoma to study mechanical engineering and joined Kappa Sigma fraternity. And while at OSU, a friend and fraternity brother, Dick Alden, introduced his little sister to Bob. Patricia Alden was a very popular debutante, and that's how Bob met the love of his life. Both were smitten, and uh, through extensive interviews with unidentified sources, uh, I'm told there was a lot of heat there, and you've, you've heard of Bogey and Bacall or uh, Gable and Lombard, well, they didn't hold a candle to Bob and Pat. Bob was a hard worker all of his life, and coming from humble beginnings, he paid for Pat's engagement ring by shoveling manure one summer. He married Pat on September 7th, 1952, then joined the Army ROTC program at OU. 
Two years later, he graduated from OU as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Reserve with a bachelor's degree in business administration and marketing and management. He went on to do graduate work in statistics and economics on a fellowship program, and he would serve in the U.S. Army Reserve until his honorable discharge as captain with the Ordnance Corps in 1965. Bob's first and only job was with City Service Company. He joined the company in 1954 as a management trainee, and his career spanned 30 years in various assignments, but chiefly in finance, corporate planning, and administration. He worked his way up the ladder to serve as executive vice president and director of Columbia Chemicals Company, a city service subsidiary. He held that position until his retirement in 1984. And over the years, his job had taken him and his family from Bartlesville to Tulsa to New Jersey and back to Tulsa again. But he was always, always deeply committed to volunteering in whatever city he lived. As a young executive, he served with the Junior Chamber of Commerce at the local and state levels and in Tulsa for the Budget and Planning Committee. He was active in PTA, Cub Scouts, and always found time to coach grade school baseball, flag football, and basketball when his boys were young. And after moving to New Jersey, he kept the, this tradition of coaching middle school basketball and baseball. He returned to Tulsa. After returning to Tulsa, he served as the president of the Home Life Association, chairman of the Executive Service Corps of Tulsa, a group of retired executives who volunteered their consultative services to nonprofits. And of course, he was a member of Rotary. Even after his retirement, he continued to serve in various capacities, including as a member of the Finance Committee at Montreux Retirement Center. Bob had a strong faith, and his dedication to service led him to give his time, talent, and resources to his church, College Hill Presbyterian. As a member of the Presbyterian Church USA, Bob served as a deacon, an elder, and as a Sunday school teacher, youth fellowship leader, and on various committees. He served as a moderator for the Eastern Oklahoma Presbytery and Senate of the Sun. He also supported the Presbyterian Church as a member of the General Assembly Nominating Committee and on the board for the United Campus Ministry. Bob had a great sense of humor, could tell a joke, but never at the expense of anyone. He was a man who always had time to listen, especially if the topic of the day was the latest gridiron performance of his beloved OU Sooners. He was crimson and cream through and through. Of all things, Bob loved his family, and even his age began to catch up with Bob. Few, if any, things gave him more joy than to hear the uncontrolled fits of giggles and laughter from his wife, daughter, and granddaughters as they would carry on in the kitchen or at the family table for Sunday dinners or family celebrations. These were some of the happiest times. His son-in-law, Michael, sons and grandsons would stay clear of the cacophony, <clears throat> but you could tell Bob was enjoying it. He was having a great time in the middle of the chaos as this gentle giant who would listen quietly and speak few words, let a sly grin appear at the corner of his mouth and his eyes began to twinkle. Anyone who knew Bob knew he was a gentle giant. He had the compassion and emotional strength of a hundred men but he was rarely known to raise his voice or give way to anger. He had the patience of Job, and no one knew his unconditional love more than his family. They witnessed it every day. Bob Lucy was a person of grace, charm, and intelligence. And asked if he had only one last wish, Bob replied that the world would know God's love and live in lasting peace. Let us all take that challenge as we remember our friend Bob Lucy. I move that this resolution be adopted by a standing vote of the Rotary Club of Tulsa. May we rise for a moment of silent tribute to the member of Robert Frank Lucy. Thank you, Melissa. The Rotary Club of Tulsa will continue to embrace the Lucy and Burks families. Please welcome Forrest Cameron with new member introductions. Forrest. Hello. 
It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Matt Redmond as our newest member of the Rotary Club of Tulsa. Matt is Vice President and Money Manager at First State Investment Advisors. He has been at First State for over three years working with fellow Rotarian Sid Shupak. Prior to joining First State, Matt worked at Helmer and Payne. He graduated from Oral Roberts University with a BS in Finance and is an Honors Fellow. Matt has been a Tulsa in his whole life and wants to help the community of Tulsa continue to grow and become a better place to live for all of its members. Matt is an avid rock climber and volleyball player in Tulsa. He is very active in multiple social sports communities in the city and when not in Tulsa, can most likely be found skiing or backpacking in the mountains. He also has a passion for local art and music. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Forrest, and once again, welcome, Matt. I'd like to invite our 2017-18 yearling chairman, John DeBar, to the podium to introduce our new Rotarians who have earned their blue badges. And assisting John with the Blue Badge presentation are this year's co-chairs, Carl Vincent and Paul Bowman. Thank you, President Hannibal. We have nine Rotarians today who have completed all of their requirements to move from a red badge to a blue badge. It's a celebration day. They have demonstrated their interest in Rotary, their dedication to Rotary, and so we wish to give them kudos today. If each of these nine Rotarians would please line up in front of the stage here as I call your name, starting on my right and moving to my left, Tanya Blancet, Tulsa Air and Space Museum, Cindy Salter, Jasso Inc., Karen McConnell, the Macintosh Group, Sarah Frey, New View, Oklahoma. Brian Jewett, Intercon Services, Inc. John Thomas Taylor, Jr., Taylor Entertainment Group. Jeff Smith, A Best Roofing. Jim Lane, A Best Roofing. Rodrigo Roja, the Gathering Place. Would you please give all of our Blue Badge Rotarians a rounding applause. Welcome to a great class of, of Blue Badgers. At this time, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce our Sarge, uh, Daniel Gomez. Daniel, it's all yours. Thanks, Hannibal, and wel welcome everybody. Good afternoon uh, to all our visitors, 18, that's, that's a lot. Uh, we actually have a lot of finds this week. Um, I think people really are enjoying this, so I want to thank everybody because every week I'm getting uh, more and more emails coming in, and I really appreciate it. We're doing pretty good on the fundraising side, and I think it's uh, I think it makes for a good uh, for for a good Sarge time. So thanks to everybody. It does. Um, the big news this week, if uh, you read the New York Times or if you're on social media, you saw that the New York Times covered the gathering place, and President Hannibal was actually quoted in this. Um, so if you haven't seen it, look it up. Um, and thank you, President Hannibal. You're a great spokesman for our city. Thank well, you so much. Thank that you. I appreciate that. Uh, my favorite part of the article was they, uh, you know, the school kids have had a chance to go around and, and play on it. And, uh, you know, there's one of them right there. And uh, she said that her favorite part is everything. <laughs> So to me, that's a good that, sign, right? Yeah, yeah, to me that kind of sums up what kind of park we're getting out of this. I just think it's amazing, and that the New York Times would cover it. I thought it was big news, so I, I, I highly encourage people to read it um, and see what's going on. Like I said, quite a few finds this week. 
Uh, Ken Snoke, $166 for his birthday on August 14th. He didn't tell me how we calculated that, so use your imagination, I guess. But thanks, Ken. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Tom Lukock, $100, birthday this week, August 16th. Happy birthday, Tom. Ed Nonweiler, $100, another birthday, August 17th. It's a busy week for birthdays. Uh, happy birthday, Ed. Joel Matson, he has a rotary anniversary, uh, August 17th. Uh, thanks, Joel. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, rotary anniversaries, I think, are pretty important. So I, I'm getting more of those, too. I really like that. Elaine Dishman, she had, gave me $100 for her rotary anniversary, which was actually a few weeks ago. But uh, thank you very much, Elaine. We really appreciate it. The next one is, is a little fun here. Uh, John Howland, our photographer, caught himself on the other end of a camera, it looks like. Uh, he showed up in the Tulsa world walking through rain. Um, I doubt it was staged because he, he appears to be holding his lunch there, but if it was staged, I, I kind of <laughs> like it, but uh, thanks, John. But to be honest, when, I, when uh, this was brought to my attention, I, I sent an email to John, asked him you know, if, he, if he wanted to pay a few bucks for, for this, and he, he paid me $25. Um, but he actually gave me an extra $75. I guess uh, John went to Amsterdam very recently and took some photographs, and this was his favorite. He wanted $75 for this. It was in an antique shop. He says it looks exactly like uh, Trisha Kirkstra. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me $75 to share this with you, and I really like it. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. As usual, Tim Nall and Weeby Trees has donated two tickets. Um, we're going to start auctioning them off uh, next week. Um, as usual, there's two for OU, two for, for OSU, so start uh, saving your money, um, eat cheaper lunch, whatever it takes. Go, let, let's, let's get some money, let's go to some games. Um, I'll reveal my, most pe some people already know my allegiance, but uh, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make a bigger deal of it next week, I promise. That's all I have for this week. Again, send me emails. I do reach out to a lot of you um, on your, you know, be, be on the lookout for me. I send out emails for birthdays and, and rotary anniversaries. Um, I think we're doing good so far. It's only been a month in and, uh, and I'm really enjoying this. So thanks everybody. Great job, Daniel. Appreciate it. Now it's time for our vocational minute, which will be presented today by Mindy Strain with NBC Bank. Mindy. Good morning, I'm Mindy with NBC. I work with Alicia Herrera, who's also a Rotarian, and Colette Adamson, who's um, in Rotaract, and she's the Secretary and Service Chair. Um, we're located in South Tulsa. Our headquarters are in Oklahoma City. Our primary focus in Tulsa is commercial lending. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be here at Rotary, and if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Mindy. Now we have a quick side mic from Lynette Potter. Lynette. Hi, everyone. I am with the sponsorship and the events committee, both very two important committees. You know, Rotary was founded in 1907 by four guys getting together for fellowship. So fellowship's super important, so I want to invite you on the 23rd, which is next Thursday, to go to Old Vine at 5.30 to 7.30 to have a little bit of Old Vine fellowship. <laughs> so come on over. We, it's, it's, you, you buy your own drinks, buy a fellow Rotarian your own drinks. And we're also gonna talk about sponsorship, and you're gonna be, be hearing a lot about sponsorship, because I'm finding out not everybody knows about it. So when you get a phone call or an email from me, don't duck, I will find you, and I will hunt you down. Thank you. Thanks, Lynette. 
Our Rotarian of the day is past president, Bob Sade. Bob is a Paul Harris Fellow, a Club Foundation Fellow, Rotarian of the Year for 2014-15, a member of the Allen Edwards Society, and has perfect attendance since joining in 1977. Bob is, in a word, amazing. So welcome, Bob. Our uh, speaker is a fourth generation Oklahoman, born in Tulsa and a graduate of ORU with her MBA degree. She's a strong supporter of career focused education and puts into action what she believes. While working as a dental assistant, she started a school named Dental Directions, later changed to Community Care College to help train others in that field. Later, she started Clary Sage College, a cosmetology school, and then Oklahoma Technical College. 2015, she converted all three colleges from a for-profit corporation to a public charity, 501c3, called Community Higher Ed, where she serves on the executive board. That were not enough. Along the way, she also started a drug and alcohol testing laboratory, which she later sold. She and her husband are directly involved with uh, commercial property acquisitions and historical preservation. They recently acquired Har Weldon on Riverside Drive, which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Other commercial development projects are in the Pearl District and South Sheridan Road. A huge music fan, as we all should be, in my opinion. <laughs> Our speaker and her husband purchased the historic church studio once owned by Leon Russell. <clears throat> and after a year of work, got it listed on the National Register of Historic Places last year. She was appointed by the governor to the Oklahoma Board of Private Vocational Schools. She's in the 2017 class of Tulsans of the Year. She's a two-time recipient of Tulsa Economic Development's Corporation Small Business of the Year, recipient of the Women of Distinction, and it goes on and on, but I'm not going to take any more of her time. Please welcome Teresa Knox. Okay, after that, I'm exhausted. I need to go back to work, so I don't know. Thank you guys for having me. It's such an honor to be here, and I've heard so much about this particular club. Love what you guys do with your foundation for our community. I think it's wonderful what you do in Nicaragua with the, the water wells program, and uh, again, it really is an honor to be here. So um, let's see if I can figure this out. I brought a few slides to talk about what I'm working on. And um, I think I will go back to this one. And uh, of course, a lot of you guys have seen this uh, very interesting structure. It's uh, called the Church Studio now, but it wasn't always called that. It's over 100 years old. It was built in 1915. And of course, its claim to fame is what happened in 1972. But a lot of people ask me how uh, I came to acquire the church. So I thought I'd share a little bit about that with you and then talk about the history of the church, what we're doing with it, and a little bit in the future. And hopefully we'll have some time for some questions if you guys have any. But yes, first and foremost, as Bob mentioned, I'm a huge music fan, especially anything Oklahoma. And of course, Leon Russell is my favorite. I'm a collector of a lot of his things, and I'll, I'll show a few things a little bit later to you and what I have in my collection. But also David Gates, if any bread fans in here, and J.J. Kell, B.J. Thomas, you name it. I lean more towards the rock and roll side. I even venture off to soft rock bread. Not as much country, but I'm so proud of our state and so many things, especially uh, during the period of significance that I'm most interested in. And that's a period, it's a really short period in our city's history. It's about from 1972 to 1976. So um, when I was younger, I used to go by the church. I was convinced I was going to see Eric Clapton or George Harrison or Leon Russell come out of the church. And so I was so enamored with the, uh, the musicians and the music industry. I got a job at a local club on Brookside. Does anyone remember the Sunset Grill? Okay, well, I worked there at the age of 21. Looked a little different. My hair was about this big and, and bleach blonde, and uh, it was fried from all my perms. But uh, I loved it, and I had an opportunity to meet so many of the great musicians that came um, from Tulsa from the 60s and the 70s and went on to their own stardom and then came back to their hometown. 
And so um, I, I went on and I uh, started a little company and did my own career. So it had been many, many years since I'd been by the church again. I purchased a building next to Circle Cinema and renovating it. And I'd love to uh, go check on uh, my construction projects, but I found myself after all of these years going by Third and Trenton and checking out the church. And honestly, I was a little disenchanted with the with the shape that it was in. There was a lot of trash. Of course, as you can see, the uh, windows are boarded up. And I would stop and pick up trash, and I thought, man, this isn't... I just didn't think it was very becoming on Leon Russell's legacy. So I did like what a lot of you guys have done before. I went on the uh, county assessor's website. I found who owned the church, and I wrote him a letter. And um, he contacted me. He said it wasn't for sale, but he'd love to visit with me. Um, we had several meetings at Hodges Bend. I don't think I've ever drank so much in my life. But uh, anyway, we... Um, came to a deal. It literally was a napkin deal, and I bought the church sight unseen. Um, he didn't really want to show me what the inside looked like, and um, probably not my finest moment. Um, my lawyer almost had a heart attack after I did the deal, but um, I uh, bought it, and as soon as I went in there, and my original plan was just to clean it up, um, pick up the trash, you know, of course, do some landscaping and some other things. But as soon as I walked in the church, started picking things up, and of course it was crumbling and falling down, I just knew that I had to continue what Leon Russell started and, and bring it back to a recording studio. And so um, that's how I acquired it. And um, I do want to go back a little bit, 100 years to be exact, 1915, again, is when the church was built. And this is what it looked like originally and it's really hard to imagine because here we have this perma stone which is a fake stone that was put on in the 50s but this is 1915 and it was one of Tulsa's first churches like this church and many of the other beautiful churches in downtown Tulsa they were built in the 1920s um, again this one is 1915 but it was built for the church for the people as you know around that time period we were at the end of our first oil boom, starting our second oil boom, and there are a lot of employees that needed uh, employment, and uh, the railroad tracks were just finished, and they strategically placed this church on the other side of the tracks because these people uh, uh, weren't the oil barons. They were, they were just the working-class people, and uh, it was, if not the first, I think it is the first, Tulsa's first integrated church. And so um, it, it really has a wonderful history. I had an opportunity to locate the original pastor's family. The original pastor was uh, Samuel Pack, and you could see the name of the church was Grace Methodist Episcopal Church, and um, they really played an important role in our community. However, no one, it wasn't, there's no Wikipedia page on it. Well, there is now. <laughs> Um, there wasn't before I acquired it, and uh, just not a lot of information on the church. So um, one thing that I found from the original pastor's family, and the great-grandson lives here, was the original mantra of the church. I absolutely love this, and, and you guys can read it. Um, one thing I'll point out um, is the word shelter, and that is a theme that, that came up and up. Um, on my research on the church. And of course, I loved everything prior to Leon Russell, but really my research had to do more with what happened when it was a recording studio. And um, I ended up interviewing 220 people to get to the truth of what happened uh, in the church, because we've all heard these crazy stories about what was going on in the 70s, but I wanted, uh, the secondary data is really important, but I wanted my own primary data and uh, started videotaping the interviews. So, um, as we mentioned earlier, none of this uh, would have been possible with what I'm doing is without Leon Russell, multi-Grammy award-winning artist, rock and roll hall of famer. And in 19, actually March 1st of 1972, Leon Russell bought the church. It was empty at the time, wasn't even in the best shape, you know, when he bought it. But Leon could have done anything. He was the number one touring artist in America. He was internationally known. 
when he bought the church, he was putting out his fourth album, and he had one album per year leading up to that time, and the 1972 album was uh, Carney. And a lot of you guys remember that one. It has, uh, of course, Tightrope, and on the, if you have the 45, the other side is This Masquerade, which is a beautiful, beautiful melody uh, written for his first wife. I had a chance to interview her a couple of weeks ago at Leon's uh, other studio at Grand Lake um, that, uh, interestingly to know, Dewey Bartlett built for him. But um, Leon Russell, um, again, could have gone any, anywhere, but he decided to come back to his hometown. And if you remember um, studios back in that time, um, Leon came from the studios where the engineers wore their white lab coats, and then you had the guys in the suits, the money guys. And he was kind of tired of the rat race in California and wanted to um, have a more casual studio where um, you knew things and music could happen, bring songwriters together. The Lynn drum was invented in the church. I mean, there's so many things um, that was going on at the time. Um, and also, Liana just uh, come back from two really big tours. The first one was 6970, the concert for, um, or Mad Dogs and Englishmen. And Matt knows a lot about that with his uh, friend Joe Cocker. And that really propelled Leon to, to superstardom. And then the second one right after that was in 1971, the concert for Bangladesh. And that was one of the first social concerts of its time in the world. And it, it drove awareness to the atrocities that were hap happening in Bangladesh. It was George Harrison's vision, but it was a superstar group that George put together. Not only Leon Russell um, and George, but Ringo Starr, the band Bad Finger, um, Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton. And it really, really was incredible what was going on with that. And um, so anyway, there's Leon. Um, one thing, I told you I'm kind of this huge mega fan. I'm kind of proud of what I'm about to tell you, but I'm a little embarrassed too. I have a 3,500 piece collection. And um, I have so many Leon Russell things, and it's all from a fan perspective. But in addition uh, to the church being a, a world-class recording studio, it was also a home office to a record label called Shelter Records. And it was a boutique record label. And um, so Tulsa, if anyone who knew anything about the music industry, they either were in Tulsa hanging out or uh, they knew about it. And so these are some, um, some things from my collection. They're actually just really bad photocopies. I apologize that with different headlines. So this one was in Rolling Stone magazine, pretty exciting, talking about our fancy venues we had. And of course you see the Assembly Center at the top, which is now the Cox Business Center. And then you have uh, the fairgrounds, um, uh, what was that called, the fairground? Oh, pavilion, yes, of course, thank you guys. And of course the Maybe Center was new and the Maybe Center was a force to reckon with. I mean, we had Elvis Presley going there and a lot of other artists, so um, I thought this was a great one. This is another one I absolutely loved. I love uh, the headline up here, Music Erupts from the Oil Fields. Uh, this one was in Billboard magazine, and it, it was preceded by tons of articles about what was going on. Um, and this one is 1972 when this one came out. Um, this, who remembers George Nye, Governor? Um, this is a really great one. He talks about, he's thanking uh, Billboard magazine uh, for honoring Tulsa. And again, this was, I think, uh, this letter is 1975. Um, and I think it's really neat. He's bragging about what's going on and what's going on in the recording industry. And remember, we not only had all the rock and roll stuff going on, but we had Jim Halsey here, um, who has represented so many country music artists. In fact, to this day, 35 of his artists that were represented right here in Tulsa are in the Country Music Hall of Fame. And so, um, again, we had a, a lot of things going on in the 70s. Um, this one by far is my absolutely favorite headline of all time from 1972. Um, we, have, uh, we have these guys, we have Leon and Oral, we have talent and the Lord on its side. How can we go wrong 
as a community in the music industry, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, adopt that mantra with what's going on uh, today. So again, I wanted to share some of those uh, headlines with you just to show you, and of course a lot of you guys were here during that time, um, and um, it, uh, it was a very special, magical time, as evidenced by the interesting people that I've had a chance to interview. So uh, you did mention early on that we did get the uh, church listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and um, that was quite a feat, and that uh, was one of my first goals, because after I started interviewing people, I was like, wow, I can't believe this was all going on here. And they were doing very innovative things that was special. And just because the structure, the church itself is over 100 years old, um, that didn't qualify it, obviously, um, to be recognized by the National Register, but it's everything that happened. So luckily, we got the blessing of the state of Oklahoma, Dr. Bob Blackburn from the Oklahoma History Center. If anyone knows Dr. Bob Blackburn, he put his blessing on it, but then it had to go to the federal federal government. I was like, oh, I don't know what they're going to say. But uh, we wrote a really great narrative uh, with a lot of firsthand accounts and evidence of what was going on. And in September, uh, this past September, it was official. We were listed on the National Register. And uh, what's really interesting to note about that is um, in D.C., the, the people that were working on all of that, they uh, confided in us that it's the first property in America where the period of significance is from the 70s. And I'm sure I can imagine them thinking, that's historical, the 70s? <laughs> and so um, anyway, we'll see uh, how many other properties after that. But um, anyway, again, I, I worked really hard on this and we had a great uh, group of people that assisted me. So I just uh, wanted to share, share that with you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we uh, are going to bring the uh, studio back to what it was uh, in 1972. Um, of course, we're going to bring it back to be a recording studio, both analog and digital. And so we'll be able to record to tape, or we'll have the latest and greatest in Pro Tools with Apple. Um, we are also going to, I'm calling it a boutique museum. I have to confess, I'm, I've been really studying the Bob Dylan archive, what's going on, and I feel like I'm stealing like their whole strategy. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, love, I love what they're doing. And I hired, actually it's my sister-in-law, I have one part-time employee, and she's cataloging my collection. And you know, we're trying to use best practices, Library of Congress, and um, so I thought, you know what, we're gonna have a museum. Um, I always was, you know, I've been collecting since I was a, a young child, so I always wondered what I was going to do with all of my stuff. My, uh, my kids certainly don't have an interest, I don't think. So um, we're putting several exhibits together. And again, uh, museum may be a stretch, but um, we're going to have some really beautiful exhibits that tell a story um, about all of these things that happen. And of course, I'm not one to live in the past, but it's so cool to be able to honor the past and hopefully inspire a whole new generation of musicians. Um, we're gonna have, I call it a posh lounge. It, it looks pretty ghetto at the moment, but uh, we have a great team and a great architect firm. We're using Chris Lilly and it's gonna be beautiful. We're putting in a theater and uh, several people today have mentioned a Circle Cinema and we're gonna be sort of a little mini satellite to Circle Cinema for music related films. It'll also be a performance space, but instead of traditional seating, um, I've, uh, uh, having custom church pews made that are radial and it will be a very intimate environment. But that I really felt like would honor the church's original history with these radial pews. So can't wait to get you guys there to, to show you that. Um, I'm doing, with all of the interviews I decided to do, I thought I'd do a film. So it's about a little biographical on Leon and Tulsa and the Tulsa sound and uh, the restoration. So it's kind of a story of redemption. And um, so I'm really excited about that film. Um, and of course, it's going to be a community space. You know, back in the day, my good friend John Woolley, if you know him, he's a great, he used to work for the Tulsa World and is award-winning uh, book author. But um, he uh, quotes in a lot of his publications that it was kind of hard to get in the church. You had to know someone. And, and uh, so I, I'm excited about being a community space to 
to be a place where all of Tulsa can enjoy and a lot of visitors too. Um, and um, of course, it's gonna be home to the Church Studio Archives, so really excited about that. Um, I wanted to share with you the renderings of what the church is going to look like. Um, the church ends about where this middle tree is right there. Um, I have a lot of pictures of um, Steinways, you would be horrified, going up these stairs and you know instruments being beat up and bands having a hard time. So we're gonna add on to the south of the structure that used to be a little house that was office to shelter records. And we are, one, getting an ADA compliant, so it's safe. We're bringing in a freight elevator for the musicians, but it's also going to have a gallery space, some green room space for musicians. And it's kind of hard to see, see from this perspective, but there are two structures, and then there'll be a beautiful courtyard in the middle. And um, in addition to getting everything ready for, for recording, everything will be set up for high def video also. So we'll have lots of opportunities for musicians to uh, record and generate other revenue streams. And um, so another thing I wanted to share with you, and uh, Jack McGlumphy will, uh, he's my neighbor of Mac Electric, and he's been in the, the neighborhood since I believe 1970, a really long time but his is the white building right there in this particular drawing. But Leon uh, owned 14 structures around the church, and he, of course, I don't have 14. I, I'm adding to my collection because, you know, with the investment that we're putting in on the church, and it really is kind of a neglected part of the Pearl District, Third and Trenton, and so um, I'm really excited what we're doing. I don't know if you recognize this Trenton um, building right here, but it is the former Garden Diva space if you've ever been there. Had about 10 layers of paint. Uh, Lisa and our artists just love painting that building. So um, I, when I first started removing the paint, I was like, I'm removing your artwork off the building, but it's beautiful brick that was exposed. We have four tenants um, in these buildings that will be moved in by October 1st. We, and everyone is music themed because as a landlord, I thought, okay, I'm gonna get involved here. I was like, you have to have something music related, Leon, Tulsa Sound, something like that. So we have a wonderful coffee shop called the Coffee Blues. Uh, we have a Mango's, which is a little Cuban restaurant with homemade fresh Cuban bread every day, um, and then two uh, gallery spaces. And uh, on 3rd Street, next to the Freeway Cafe, we have another property, and we have a music uh, and food venue that's going in. So um, it's uh, kind of a grassroots effort. Everyone is working hard to clean up their space and pick up the trash. And so I've been really proud of the neighborhood. We've just kind of been old schooling it, going door to door, talking with the neighbors. And, and so really excited about that. So in addition to the church studio, my good friend David T. Garden is one block down the street. And if you don't know David, he's an amazing uh, world-class drummer. He uh, got his Grammy Award with Bob Seger, you know, Against the Wind. That's David. Uh, playing the drums for all of that. So his studio is there, and a third studio is opening within this one block period. So I thought, we need a name. And of course, we don't want to be Nashville Music Row or even Austin because we're Tulsa. You know, we don't have to be like all of those people. And so um, we started calling it Studio Row. It's hard to see here, but studio's on the top and sort of a retro sign. Um, in uh, permitting with the uh, city of Tulsa. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but um, we're really excited uh, about that. Um, so, you know, I talked about my collection. I can't, I, I have a lot of documents. I have original writings of Leon lyrics and that never went to music music that he never wrote lyrics for and it really really is fascinating i was in uh, la recently at a recording studio there and uh, uh it was really cool because rolling stones they were there and i thought oh it's so cool i'm like living my you know childhood dream of being in the rock and roll industry but um the engineers that were um uh, actually it was sunset sound and um they said, oh, you know, I was telling them about the church, and of course they knew all about Tulsa and the great musicians that came out of here. 
and they said, it was so amazing that Leon could do all of those songs and he couldn't even read music. And of course, my heart stopped because he was a child prodigy pianist. He was classically trained. He wrote all of his music. I have music from you know, writing the music to the lyrics, to him putting in a full orchestra, to how it's going to uh, be presented on his album. And so I was, you know, trying not to get offended, but it was my opportunity to educate them. But um, as you guys know, later in life, uh, Leon uh, used a cane, and most people don't realize he had cerebral palsy. Growing up here and being a Leon fan, I had always heard polio and yeah, all these other things, but he had cerebral palsy, and that contributed to his very unique piano playing style. And so I have a few more canes than this. These are some of my favorites. It's kind of hard to see because of um, you don't have the full picture, but he has some very ornate canes, and I, I'm really honored to have those. Um, these, um, I don't know if you remember the Slurpee Cups in the 70s from 7-Eleven. Um, I've had one since I was a child. I acquired a second one, um, actually on eBay. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. But uh, 7-Eleven picked 50 top musicians in America to feature them. Um, and so I have these in my collection. And I was thinking, oh, I wonder if I could talk Quick Trip into doing Leon's. They can't use Slurpee. We think that's trademarked by 7-Eleven. But how cool would that be? Um, I have several of Leon's shirts. Of course, you know, back in the 70s, Leon had, um, he was very flamboyant, his top hat, he had uh, embroidery on his clothes and wild looking jeans and a lot of different things. But later, as you know, he traded in that for Hawaiian shirts and cowboy hats. So um, these are, I have several hats, these are three. This is one of his original top hats. It's kind of hard to see it on top. Um, what's interesting about this top hat that he had, it's made by the Knox Hat Company, and I thought, oh, that's foreshadowing. I mean, it was like meant to be that I get the church, and so, but I love that hat, and I wear it all the time, so. Um, this is one of his cowboy hats and another hat, so he had a, an amazing hat collection, so we're really excited to own a few of these. Um, and then one thing that Leon was, I don't know if it's an obsession, but he had hundreds of masks. I have about a dozen of them. And of course, I mentioned earlier this masquerade, which is a beautiful, beautiful melody. Uh, it's been performed by so many people, George Benson to Karen Carpenter. Beautiful, beautiful song. Um, it was, again, written about his first wife. But I've, uh, I'm working on an exhibit that... Uh, that shows off some of his mask and really um, why he had three songs that talked about uh, living a life with a mask and a masquerade. So that's gonna be a really uh, interesting exhibit, I think. So um, again, I just wanted to share with you some of that collection. Um, I'm, um, and I know you guys know this, there's so many things going on in Tulsa. And it's, it's sort of sad when you think about the 70s because we were on top of the world and we lost it. And a lot of people have analyzed, like, why did Tulsa lose that magic that was going on, again, with Leon and, and the, the people around him that those four short years. Um, one thing, sadly, is cocaine. It was rampant in this community. Uh, we had some issues not only with the cocaine dealers, but with our police force and uh, competition with the cocaine dealers. We had elements of the Louisiana mob here. We had musicians that were so brilliant like Leon and so great. And it's, it pains me to say this, but they were not good business people. I see some of this stuff, I was like, oh my gosh, if we would have done this. Um, not that I have all the answers in business, but, um, and then we had, we had several record labels, we had several law firms that represented artists. They weren't always, um, they didn't always have the artist's best interest at heart. And so, uh, and of course, Leon had it really, really rough. By the end of his time at the church studio, he, um, he had uh, crossed over um, some to, music, uh, to the country music. And I don't know if anyone remembers Hank Wilson, but it was kind of, remember when Garth Brooks did that Chris Gaines thing and we we're all kind of freaked out about it? 
Does anyone remember Chris Gaines? I don't know, it was bizarre. The lost weight, the black hair. Um, but um, Leon was the first person to do that. So Leon was top in his field, and then he decided to do country music and change his name. And not only that, his album was his backside, so it wasn't even his face. Well, the rock and roll community, they, weren't, they didn't look um, at him like they did Olivia Newton-John and some of the others. And then on top of that, um, the rock and roll people were mad at him, and then he married a black woman, Mary McCreary, a brilliant musician. So he was shunned by the country music, and it really hurt his career. And Tulsa wasn't, wasn't really embracing the long-haired music as much as they were embracing Jim Halsey. And so he left town. And, um, and then, of course, you know, a lot of things happened after that. But I love what's going on now. You know, back in the day, there was a lot of jealousy. There was a lot of... It just, there was no kumbaya going on, but I think there's so many people committed to making Tulsa, you know, this viable music city, and I think we can do it, and you guys know all of these brands, and of course, our shining star that's driving so much awareness to our community is the BOK Center. I mean, it's just, just incredible. Um, Leon Russell, uh, there's three green rooms. We have a Garth Brooks room. We have um, a Woody Guthrie room, and then there's a Leon Russell room. So I'm really proud of that. Um, of course, we have kind of two disruptors in the marketplace. That's Margaritaville, River Spirit Casino, and Hard Rock. Mostly a disruption to the venues like Canes and Brady. Canes, not so much. They're, they're a really great size. The Brady, what, about a 2,700-seat theater. Uh, love Peter Mayo, love that theater. It was built two years before the church, 1913. And unlike the Canes that was built for Tate's car garage, it was really built for, for the people of Means in Tulsa. It's a beautiful theater. Um, of course, I've talked about the Bob Dylan archive. And not only do we have this amazing archive from the generosity from GKFF, but we're gonna have a Bob Dylan Center, and you guys know about that, it's very exciting. And then we have OK Pop, and they have an amazing collection for music, for so many different things in the arts, but uh, they have a, an amazing Leon Russell collection. It's a little different than mine, um, because mine is purely from a fan perspective, but uh, I've been working with them, and I'm really excited about that opening. And a lot of people don't know, we have Tulsa FMAC, Tulsa Film, Music, and Arts Committee. I actually sit on that committee. And what can we do to sell Tulsa to musicians to make this a serious, viable city? Um, so it's a destination city for music, but then also they're very involved with the film industry and, and the tax credit, the 35 cents on the dollar tax credit that we have. So um, anyway, I, um, I'm, I'm, that's all I was going to say. So I, <laughs> I, I could keep going on and on, but I'm done. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. So. Well, thank you, Teresa, for that really enthralling presentation. Look forward to seeing what happens at the church. Um, we have our book, It Takes a Village, by Hillary Adam Clinton. It'll be donated to our partner in education school, Celia Clinton Elementary. Upcoming programs include August the 22nd will be Mike Patterson, the state of Oklahoma's roads. And we know what, we know what that state is. And then August the 29th, uh, Danny O'Connor and the Outsider's House. So we thank you for being here, and let's not lose sight of that grand Rotary International vision, which is, together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Please note that our new member and his sponsor will be at the guest table out in the foyer area. As you exit, please take a moment to personally welcome Matthew Redman to our Rotary family. We are adjourned.